Welcome to the pod, ladies and gentlemen, the founder and CEO of MoviePass, Stacy Spikes. Hey, Rich. How are you? I am well. So lovely to see you here. It is not a coincidence that most superheroes have alliteration in their names, Peter Parker, Stacy Spikes. But then as soon as I said that, I realized Rich Robinson has alliteration yeah. too. So it's like, there you go. like pat patting myself on the back. Yes. But I'd heard legend of you, my friend, way before we actually got to work together during the depths of COVID. And it was absolutely amazing to meet you in person finally a year ago, June, in your headquarters in New York City. I continue to be president and founding member of the Stacey Spikes <laughs> fan club. And all of the voodoo that you do is is amazing. And would love for you to talk about Movie Pass, give an intro and what you're working on right now, please. Sure. Well, thank you for that intro. And back at you, you're pretty remarkable. So we'll get into your story on a, on another podcast. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, this is all about you, my friend. <laughs> so Movie Pass, yeah. So originally founded it in 2012, and we took it up to an exit in 2017. And the private equity group that bought it kind of drove it off a cliff. And year before last, I bought it back to relaunch the company and bring it back. There was a desire to help Hollywood get back on its feet. And there was a cry and demand from TikTok and Instagram users who were like, I want my movie pass back. And then with the wonderful help of Anna Mocha and you, you guys came in as investors. Make sure that we uh, put that out there for uh, any conflict of interest. Um, and we're getting back in the fight and Hollywood's getting back on its feet with Barbie and Oppenheimer that just opened. Barbie Heimer numbers. indeed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. T so, tell us, tell us your industry insider. Tell us some numbers from that launch. So July, that opening weekend was the third highest grossing weekend ever. And the fourth weekend of the month was the highest fourth weekend of July in cinema history. And so the numbers are off the charts. What's also remarkable is it would neither film or franchises. They were both original IPs. And that's also a rare thing. And you had Greta, who's the director of Barbie. She broke the record for highest grossing opening weekend for a female director in history. So it's showing that people want to go to the movies. People love going to the movies. And we're talking box office records across the globe, not just in the U.S. So it's remarkable, but it's proving the strength and power of this art form that I love and that you guys have chosen to support and, and be part of. Yeah. And I'd love to dive deep into the first meeting between you and Yat later in the podcast, but let's dive deeper into the origin story. I've heard you speak of you and your co-founder thinking of like Netflix for movie theater, a subscription for movie theater, which is so crazy when you launched it. There was so much resistance, right? Yeah. And you're both founders of color and yeah. you're in an industry that's not necessarily embracing technology. They're yeah. really kind of almost like a transplant that the body's trying to like fight and, yeah. and push out. Tell us about that. What was it, 10, 10, 11 years ago when you started out? Yeah. So when you think of 2012, Netflix was still pretty young. I think it was eight years, seven, eight years old at that point. And so on the horizon, you could see Spotify and Netflix and Hulu and these subscriptions that were starting to be born. And the reason subscription companies are so valuable is you don't have to reacquire the customer every single time. And so the way the movie industry has worked for 70, 80 years now is let's say Warner Brothers says we're going to make three Batman. So they charge for one and get, they spend all the marketing dollars, get everybody in. And then 
rinse and repeat. They have to get everybody to come back again. But when you have a subscription, you can pretty much count that they're in, but you can kind of count that revenue. So Hollywood spends equal to what it costs to make movies. It spends the same on customer acquisition. In a subscription, you don't have to do that. So you save almost 50% of the cost. So we just saw with the industry where at least 20 million people go every week, and it's the number one out of home entertainment activity in the world, more than sporting events, music events, and amusement parks combined. Wow. Wow. So can we pause there for a second? I mean, I've even heard the opposite, like the demise of the movie industry, like streaming rules. And why would you leave the home when you have these amazing home theater systems? But obviously it's literally the exact opposite, especially with Barbie Heimer. Yeah. And and so here's the thing to think about. So let's take sporting events. So in the U.S., you have football, basketball, hockey, baseball, all of those combined. So the movie going has a billion transactions in the U.S. in a single year. And the average ticket price is ten dollars. Well, the average sporting event ticket price is north of $100. So it's restrictive for people to go as much and as often. Mm-hmm. And so the average uh, team in, in a season has only 12 games and you have roughly 12 teams. So you can never get up to the numbers that cinema does. So a lot of people long ago this device, this television that I'm holding. Long ago, the number of screens in home was larger than back in the 50s, it surpassed the number of screens in theaters. But what didn't surpass it is that activity of people going out of their homes to be in a communal space with other people to consume entertainment, right? And so you have those other forms, and they still are half of what movie going is. And so it gets beat up a lot, but it's still the king of the hill. It's still the thing that VR and everything is trying to emulate. That's the beauty of it. And so, of course, new technologies are going to get a lot of new press, and they're going to get the lion's share of that noise. Like, here's the new, new thing but you still have something that is very, very powerful that just can't be beat. The, what we call sight and sound, the in theater experience is really strong. There's many tools that show virality when something catches storm and people get excited about it, you get Barbenheimer, you know, so. Thank you for establishing that. Post COVID, you'd think This is the real test because everybody is very comfortable with doing things through a screen, whether they prefer it or not. And it turns out people want to be out. There's a social animal dynamic around that. And there's the experience and there's theaters stepping up their games too. And there's an added piece. And so it happened with Black Panther. So it's post COVID. Black Panther comes out and Disney decided to have a clear window that was, I think, 90 days to six months between when it showed in theaters and when it streamed. And what they found was it was at the time the highest grossing movie of that season, but then it was also the number one streamed. So what media does and press does is they say either or, but the answer is actually and. So the same person who went and watched it in theater also watched it on a streaming service, right? And so that's the thing that it's not either or, it's and, we're going to do both. And so to conflate the windows is to rob yourself of the opportunity as a company to get revenue twice, because we are going to see it twice. Excellent point, I think. Pixar, DreamWorks, are they really competing or is it really just rising the tide for all boats and creating more demand and uh, attraction towards high-end animation? And yeah, it can be it can be a win-win for everybody. So yeah, thanks for establishing that because I think that's something that's really important because 
I think a lot of listeners or other people would be like, yeah, right. I mean, like, okay, I get it. But like, that's a sinking ship and you're yeah. trying to capitalize on the getting people's attention while the Titanic is sinking, right? Because nobody else, everybody's jumping off, right? But it's absolutely not the case. Well, you, the last time we saw each other, you were here in New York and here's a funny antidote. So everyone said movies was going to kill Broadway and right. television was going to kill cinema. Cable was going to kill regular TV and then VR is going to kill everybody. Right. And so, but if you notice Broadway is mostly made up of movies that you see and get to know these characters, but now you can see these actors who are on stage and it's a higher ticket price. And so what cinema did was actually made Broadway several times bigger than it. Is. So you can go see the Lion King, you can see Harry Potter. So why is it that Broadway's never been bigger, right? So what it does is it, it funnels the pipeline in both directions. But what they found is when you start with IP that is sitting on television, it doesn't have the same legs as when IP starts in a communal way in theaters and then goes in the other direction. So I, I always say if you're an artist, a musical artist, and you don't tour and you don't get in front of people, you will always be a television musician. But when you look at careers like Bruce Springsteen or anybody who has a very strong touring base, what they're doing is making these connections with people that over time, people want to come back and experience. And so that's why human connection and seeing live theater, being in a movie theater is primary to say television in the long run. Excellent. Yeah. It's yes. And, and yeah. the entire pie. And if you think about what are we going to do when AI takes over the world? We're all going to just create and consume more content and there's going to yeah. be more ways to do that. And that's, that's already happening. So, okay. We've established that you were a freaking genius a decade ago and saw that subscription, saw that movie was going to continue to be hot, saw that you could chip away at the establishment and introduce subscription, which was initially a lot of resistance. And now it's become absolutely part of the fabric of the, the whole industry. Now <clears throat> you've kind of taken it out of the ashes. I mean, maybe we could spend a little time later in the pod about your amazing book, Black Founder, and some of the lessons learned along the way. But let's talk about the, the latest, greatest of what you're working on. You rise like a phoenix from the ashes and you meet Yatsio, the founder and chairman of Animoca Brands, and you guys vibe out around Web3 and how that can yeah. completely reinvent and evolve what you're doing. Talk about that, please. Yeah, so that was really a profound experience. A group of investors had come into MoviePass and I got a call and they said, hey, there's this guy yet. He'd really like to talk to you about what you're doing. And I knew of yet, but just in passing, we, we didn't personally know each other. And I said, absolutely, that'd be great. And the first conversation we had yet was dropping some Web3 knowledge on me that I was like, huh, I never looked at it that way. Right. And so we agreed to meet. He was in San Francisco and I flew up and um, I, I was in New York. We were doing a commercial in L.A. and I flew up and met with him. And while we were there, Yat said some huge things and, and he's so poetic in how he explains them. I will bastardize them and not do nearly as good of a job. But what he said was he found that NFTs, tokens and the entire community around crypto has a very strong connection with things that are commemorative. And so he talked about sporting events. He talked about musical events. He talked about art. He talked about gaming and he talked about cinema. And he said, people want something that they can be reminded of. And I remember going back after our meeting and I looked up 
the collectible market and saw that it's in the billions per year. It's bigger than even cinema is. The trading of collectibles is even bigger on an annual basis. I looked up the highest trade movie collectible is a little three inch doll of Star Wars Boba Fett. And it was originally, I think, three dollars. And it had a little projectile on his backpack that would you press a button and it would shoot off. And because they determined it was a choking hazard, the collectible, there was only 10 made and the rest got destroyed. So there's 10 of these in the world. And it holds the Guinness Book of Records as being the highest from what its original value was. So it's, it was sold for a, a quarter of a million dollars. But what I saw was, yet yeah, was absolutely right. People go see something, they experience something, and they want something memorable that says, I was there in the real world. And so he said, I see that MoviePass is a consumer facing product which is galvanizing a community where studios and theaters are they're not a community they're just selling a product so he said i think that movie pass is a community that when you harness the power of that i think that it can finance movies itself it can give itself tokens and currency for the commemorative experiences that they have. And these things can have value. And he says, and I think it can all be digital and live on the blockchain. I sat there like this. Right. I mean, I felt like this spaceman was coming down from another planet and saying, mere mortal, let me explain the future to you. And so he said, if you agree with the vision that I see, We'd love to invest and be part of it and help MoviePass to, you know, bring the Web3 and crypto and blockchain and DAO tools to the market for the movie industry. And I've never forgotten that. I had goosebumps sitting there when he and I were talking about financing pictures through a DAO that the consumers are able to do on their own and ensure that the movie industry is always vibrant and that filmmakers can constantly make content and they don't have to go through a studio or a theater circuit to determine whether or not those things can happen. Because the the third leg of the stool has been missing. You don't have the audience perspective as an agent on behalf of the content creators. And he said, bringing those two worlds together in a blockchain digital world democratizes filmmaking that has never happened before. There's only five or six people who determine what we all see. He said, what if the audience starts to determine what we see? And that I was, I was like, where do I sign? Like, let's go. Fantastic, yeah. And he is indeed sort of a poet philosopher tech king in a way, and he has a very sort of a melodic way of talking about the about the future. I often call him the Keanu Reeves of Web3. Everybody, yeah. no, nobody doesn't love that guy. There are so many amazing parallels, I think, with Web3 as this creator economy and the internet of ownership and community. It's really fascinating to me People talk a lot about community with Web3, but the community that you were able to build, the kind of brand, not just recognition, but the kind of uh, brand, uh, almost fanaticism around what you've built. And, and if you really think about it, and I mean this from a place of respect, like you're not making the movies, no. you don't own the theaters, no. but yet I meet people and they talk about movie pass in these sort of like hush tones they, they, they just just really spoke to people and now you've been able to leverage that and take some of that existing community from the days of yore and you've relaunched can you tell us about how how that's uh, been going yeah so originally back when COVID was happening people started posting 
TikTok videos and you and I are a little bit older, but it's a throwback to the chant of I want my MTV, right? And they started posting, I want my movie pass. And I went back to look to see if we could get it back. And lo and behold, it was available. And I bought it back for $140,000. And just a few years before, it was valued at half a billion dollars. And so the brand was intact, but it had been tarnished because the private equity group who had bought it did a lot of nefarious things because they put the price point too low. And instead of raising the prices to an appropriate place, they charged people but prevented them from being able to go. And so, which they call um, and so once it closed its doors because they couldn't maintain that, we bought it back. And I got to tell you the relaunch, we've taken our time. We've always been data first. We've always been, try this, test it in a market. That went good in one market, move it to five markets. Okay, launch it nationwide. So we always have this discipline of test, deploy, expand. And um, so we're six months into the new product. We've got a lot of people that are on it and we've got some great feedback and we had some kinks in the beginning because it was a whole new system. The difference between the old system and the new was the universe was one size fits all. So a $200 million movie and a $5 million independent film are the same price even though one's playing on a really big screen and one's playing at an art house. That doesn't make sense. It's kind of like seeing Beyonce at Madison Square Garden and seeing a jazz musician and the ticket price is the same for both. So the, the, the marketplace has no variable pricing and doesn't allow for any elasticity. That's where we come in. So what we did was this time around, we give you credits and so if you want to go see movies midweek when the theaters are empty, that's fewer credits. If you really just want to go on Friday and Saturday night, that's more credits. We're in Manhattan, the mecca of independent cinema and theaters. There's a major theater and a smaller theater that you can literally see both of them. You could throw a rock and hit the same movies play. One theater charges 20 something, another theater charges $12 in Manhattan. So if you wanna to go to the theater that charges $12, you should be able to pay less. And that's what we brought into the system with this variable pricing to dr help drive traffic where there's value for customers. If you wanna pay full price all the time, you don't need movie pass. But if you wanna be a frequent flyer but you want a loyalty program that covers the whole universe, that's where we come in. Hmm. Fascinating, bringing in that business model innovation and the pricing innovation. So you're continuing to innovate in that space. What are some of the things on the roadmap that you're going to be rolling out in the coming quarters? Yeah, so roadmap, we're coming out with universal e-ticketing. So right now you get a physical card. People do love their cards, but they aren't as easy as they they, t they were 10 years ago. You just don't need them, the, our smartphones. So what we're going to do is make it that your card, you will be able to put into your wallet. You'll be able to purchase tickets online at all theaters. So you don't have to walk to the theater to get your ticket. We have social features that are coming. So we have reviews you're going to be able to see what your friends saw. You're going to be able to coordinate and go together. You're going to be able to share credits and points. So maybe I didn't go this month, but I can give you my points. We're looking at also having video reviews. So celebrities and actors could record videos personally. So like, let's say The Rock wants to thank everybody who went to see his movie on opening weekend. He could record something and we could send it just to the people that went on opening weekend and saw that, right? And then the Web3 stuff is we're looking to create a DAO to democratize and allow the community 
imagine your ticket is also a token, right? And your your ticket allows you to have ownership so that when you go and you see, you're also getting ownership and supporting the creators and that community. So today, a film fan spends money, but leaves with just memories. And what Yat really had pointed out was let that film fan share in something so that the creator is giving them something and they get a piece of ownership of that in the form of a artifact that also can increase in value with time. And that, that was the general idea. And so what I'm really thrilled about that you and your team are helping us do is to bring that to reality. Wow. You think with Super Mario Bros, how they incorporate the Nintendo Maxis from the beginning when they're conceptualizing the movie because they don't want there to be a bunch of haters who are really trashing the movie when it launches. They need that kind of buy-in from the community from the beginning. And not only the buy-in, but maybe they're actually shaping it or maybe in the future, they're actually maybe even investing in it. And then they're able to get exclusive screenings and talk to some of the actors and the director and get upside on that. If you're going to really support in in a way, like you're this connective tissue to be able to enable that. And it's pretty fascinating. It's definitely power to the people where at the end of the day, the studio and the theaters cannot do this without the, the consumer and the consumer has never had a seat at the table and that's mm-hmm. the most powerful seat at the table. And so if they can harness that decision-making power, that's what Yat was really bringing. So movie pass from being a transactional app for movie tickets to being a community aggregator that harnesses that not only buying power, but creation power. So if Christopher Nolan says, hey, I want to make three Batman, Warner Brothers gave me 50 million for each of those, he could then come to the DAO and say, approve for me 50 million. And the DAO could say, we agree to buy $50 million in tickets from each of those films. And he doesn't have to fly around the world trying to raise money. The fans literally can green light his picture and he can go one before you even make it right and he can bank that promissory note out the gate and that's the power of that subscription commitment that they're already there there's nothing that has to be done right that just saying yes we promise we are going to go see your movie when it comes out and it's not a large commitment because you'll just look at what did we do on his last film with the box office So you'll take Oppenheimer and you'll say, how many people went to see Oppenheimer in our system? Okay, safely, we can guarantee that, that that's probably going to happen again. And each of those people are also going to get a token for their going. And they start to have fractional ownership in all of this content that they're supporting. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, I remember reading about Ryan Reynolds. He took 11 years to try to raise money for Deadpool. And then it became the highest grossing R-rated movie of all time. And then I see now, we talked about Keanu Reeves, Constantine 2, like they want to launch that movie. And and the interwebs is losing its mind. Like this movie needs to exist. And if you could see uh, in the future, the ability for people to rally other people and say, hey, buy these tokens, that's yeah. going to get converted into a future ticket or maybe even some upside in the movie. Like that's kind of martial resources in a way that will also create new sources of content. It doesn't have to be all these derivative, like you talked about how Barbie and Oppenheimer were not parts of gigantic franchises. And I think almost all the top grossing films in 2022 were all franchises, right? It's time to to refresh that. Mm. Man, it's super exciting. And t- tell us a little bit more about your hero's journey along the way and what kind of prepared you for doing what you're doing now and um, some of the lessons learned along the way. Tell us a bit about your life and, and career and 
I, I loved reading the galleys of your book, Black Founder. It's such a fantastic story. And I know that you have a, a documentary coming out about you. Are we able to talk about that? So Mark Wahlberg and his production team reached out and they loved the rise and fall story, right? And they said- Rise, fall, hey, rise. We, yeah, exactly. And they said, we really think this is a great American story. And it could be a cautionary tale, but once we were able to buy it back, it was like the rise, fall, and rise of Movie Pass. And so that's coming out in the first quarter of next year. So it's a documentary, it's interviews. It tells the backstory from the origin story of how Movie Pass came to be, how it rose, how it fell, and then bought it back. So they take it all the way up to when we buy it back and relaunch it. And so that's coming. And to, you know, kind of answer the first part, you know, I, a lot of people always said, do what you love and the money will follow, you know, just follow that thing that you want to do every day and it's not really working. And my whole career was, I've always been a behind the scenes orchestrator, whether it was the music industry or the film industry, my job was to help bring the creator and the audience together because there's so much noise and so much demand on people's attention. You have to be able to cut through that noise and give people a reason why you should give this film two hours of your time or this this album you should buy it and pay the ten dollars or twenty dollars and for the 90 minutes of music right and so <clears throat> that's always been my job but i've had this great passion around movie going because i grew up working in a video store all through high school and people would walk in and, and they would look at you and say, what should I watch this weekend? And before there was recommendation engines, it was the person in the video store. It was that person tearing your ticket. You would ask, oh, I'm going to see Spider-Man, but how's Dark Knight? Is Dark Knight good? Should I see that too? They were these recommendation engines. And that was the beginning of how do you explain to people why they should see something? And and so that became, that's what I do to this day. I do it in app form, but I tell you, why should you become a subscriber? Why should you, it brings your costs down, but it opens up your world of discovery and you no longer have to sit every time and go through a decision process. You just have to go, do I have time for this? And I have a pass. I can go to any theater I want and boom, I'm in and like it or don't like it. It didn't really cost me more, right? It cost me two or three movie tickets a month and I can go all I want. So every innovation is make it cheaper, better, faster, right? And when you make something cheaper, better, faster, it doesn't mean that the quality is cheaper, but you bring the cost down and the value goes up and you're able to make a better product. So it just seemed like subscription for theatrical it's just such a better product and what we found was the average person who joins goes to the movies 50 percent to 100 percent more we saw people in two market studies over a two-year period that they increased from 100 to 144 percent the amount of time that they go to the movies once they join a subscription service that's amazing and if we can help the industry, I believe if 30% of moviegoers become subscribers, you'll double the size of the entire movie industry. Fantastic vision. And you're absolutely the person to make that happen. Tell us some of the trials and tribulations along the way, Ooh. as well as some of your triumphs and what you've learned from that. But before you do though, can yeah. you share one thing that I love about you is what was the first thing that you did when you woke up this morning that you do every day? <laughs> you're, you're throwing a lob because you know the answer. Um, I know the answer and I want you to let everybody so, understand the sort of discipline behind you and, and talk about your Michael Jordan fever story. Uh, you wouldn't give up. Okay. So I'll first set it up. 
I was, you know, this executive who's flying 75, 100,000 miles a year, you know, overweight, eat too much, bad food, blah, blah, blah. And I'm a vegetarian, so I ate pretty, pretty well compared to most people. But <clears throat> I read this Wall Street Journal article about running streaks and people who ran every day. And this article was about this guy who had run every day for 40 years. And I was like, that's crazy. And it talked about this group. And there was a website called runeveryday.com. And I pulled it up after reading this article. I'm sitting at my desk and it said, do you want to be consistent and run every day? Well, just join us. And it was $20. You send $20. You fill out this affidavit. I, it's a prompt. I will run every day for a year you send in $20 and <clears throat> psychologically it worked. I put in the money and if you get a year, they will list you in a registry. And so, then every, every year it's, it's, you re up. I will run every day for a year. You send in another $20 and the $20 just goes to maintain this global registry. So why is rich asking this? So, May is my anniversary month. Last month, I made nine years that I wow. have not missed wow. a day. And so the goal is you have to run at least a mile every day on your own power in a 24 hour period. And I've had some pretty adventurous moments where from flying to New Zealand and I had to get it in in 24 hours. I remember flying to London once and it was raining in New York. So I didn't run and I'm running through like Hyde Park at like midnight in London when I land. And so you, the story that you're talking about was after COVID, like last year, yeah, last year, I got a fever of 104 and my wife goes, you are not running. And I've got eight years, right? I got eight years of this. <laughs> and so she went, she was in the bathroom and I went in the kitchen and I took some Excedrin. <laughs> and I grabbed my shoes and my clothes and I snuck outside in the hallway. I put on my running clothes and I went running and I texted her when I got outside and I said, here is my run route. If I am not back in 15 minutes, <laughs> please come and look for me on this route. She was so pissed, but you know, I got it done. And uh, that's, that's like my, Michael Jordan playing in the finals with that, with that huge fever. Yeah. Like, you know what, like this is, this is where it's defined. Right. Yeah. And yeah. It, it seems, but, but I mean, like that's a beautiful story, right? The nine years of consistency, but then those peak, you know, when you really have to make that painful decision yeah. of like, got to do this. I'm doing yeah. it. I've, yeah. I've already decided yeah. it's going to suck. But, yeah. and like, I think that's a beautiful foundation yeah. for the discipline and the cadence of what you've built over your career and through movie pass. Yeah. It, it's, it's everything because, and I'm not kidding. And I love that you brought it up. People don't bring that up and you are a hundred percent correct because that foundation at the beginning of your day, no matter how you feel, no matter what stresses are going on in your life, no matter what the weather is. So some people will run on treadmills. I only run outdoors. So if it's typhoon rain going sideways, I'm out there, right? I'm in a rain slicker. I'm that idiot. And it's so when you've done that at five or six o'clock in the morning, what the hell else? Is you can't hurt me. To to you? you can't right. hurt me. It's, it's what, what, what else? Like I'm going to get up and I'm going to do this again tomorrow. So whether it's a disappointment with an investor or a disappointment in a quarter in sales or a disappointment, any kind of disappointment, someone quits the company who's really valued, you go, okay, tomorrow we're going to get up and we're going to keep going and we're going to mission critical and it's a measurable focused mission. And it's the foundation for everything. And uh, I got to tell you, really, it's not even about the distance. It's about the decision, you know. Indeed. 
And you can only control two things, which is your action and your reaction. So if you're controlling your action every day, then the ability to control your reaction when stuff happens to you that you have no control over is strengthened indeed. And let's use some movie metaphors because, you know, that's the whole theme of this is like, you're like Sergeant Dan up in the top of the mast. And you're like, is that the best you can do? Bring it. Right. hundred percent. Yeah. That's it. That's, wow. and, and it really reading that article. And I, I, if you just do wall street journal run running streak, and they've written several articles and I, and it's so inspiring and what's really cool is when you join and and this has played a role in even how we built movie pass moviegoers are like runners or like surfers or like skateboarders they are a type of people who love the experience of this and so my being a member of this community of runners we treat the same respect with movie going community and so there's a parallel to how we treat the culture. Like I try and write letters to our members. I do four or five calls every day to customers who've called mm. into customer service. And it's not, it's kind of like, don't focus on the big stuff, focus on the little stuff. If you get the little stuff right, the big stuff takes care of itself. And so it's about creating this ultimate consumer experience that you're building when you see athletes or celebrities who take the time to do selfies with fans that waited in line for two three hours just to see them not even that they're gonna say hi but to see them when you see Shaq or Jordan even though they don't play anymore stopping and talking to people say man that shot in the last game that you did 20 years ago changed my life. And they're going, thank you. It, because they know they're trying to give back to the person that chose to buy that ticket or buy that pair of shoes or whatever. And, and that's what we try and do. And for me, running every day is a discipline to that commitment to the we rather than the me. That's beautiful. I think that's a terrific place to stop. Stacy Spikes, ladies and gentlemen, founder and CEO of MoviePass. Check out his incredible book, Black Founder, and I can't wait to watch Maki Mac Wahlberg's <laughs> documentary all about you and what you've built in Q1 of next year. Thank you so much, my friend. Rich, thank you for everything, buddy. Appreciate it. Thanks. This podcast is for information purposes only and should not be considered as financial advice. Any opinions provided in this podcast reflect the views of the speakers only.